Well, this morning I want to talk to you about small yeses to a big God. Uh, everything fruitful and vibrant in our spiritual lives lives comes from our comes from our yeses to God. You could also use the word alignment or agreement to that statement. When we align our mind, will, and emotions and heart with what God wants, when we come to agreement and embrace and say yes to his purposes, his leading, it uh, takes us into great fruitfulness. I often think of Abraham. You know, he was uh, several hundred miles away, I don't know the exact number, and God speaks to him to go to what is now Israel. And uh, he says to Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. So many descendants, you can't even count them. And he goes, okay. I mean, he had a wife that was pretty old. Uh, it was not really humanly possible for this uh, prophecy or this speaking uh, of what God spoke to him. But he said, yes. And the Bible says that Abraham is our father in the faith. And his small yes led to what we know as uh, the lineage of, of David unto Christ. And we see the Christ coming and the resurrection and the blood and all the good stuff that we love to talk about on Sunday mornings. My wife, uh, when she was 10 years old, was at a summer camp and there was a puppet uh, show and it was all about missions. And during a puppet show, God spoke to my wife who was 10 years old and she felt like God called her to be a missionary and she, she said yes to that. So we met in YWAM a few years later. In the spring of 1979, I was a young college student in central Minnesota, and uh, a friend of mine came through and spent the weekend with me, and he had just come back from a YWAM school. I didn't know much about YWAM. His name was Todd Johnson. He's now Dr. Todd Johnson from Gordon-Conwell University, and he cranks out all the stats of Christendom around the world. And, uh, but he was just a young guy back then, and he told me all about YWAM and DTS and all our acronyms. And uh, the next day in class, I'm in my psychology class, which I hated because it was all about Freud and all this weird stuff. And I was getting a horrible grade, which will make you not like any college class. And right in the middle of that class, it wasn't an audible voice, but this overwhelming, compelling thought came into my mind. Uh, stop uh, attending university, join Youth of the Mission, do it now, be obedient now, now is the time, go. So I drove home 70 miles and took my parents out for a steak dinner because I figure they're gonna be upset, I'm dropping out of school and if I'm in a restaurant, they can't yell at me. So I said, mom and dad, I'm gonna quit school and join Youth with a Mission and my mom said, youth, youth with a what? Uh, youth with a Mission. Now you gotta remember, this is 1979, this is six months prior. Some of you remember the term drinking the Kool-Aid, the Jim Jones cult. 900 people committed suicide in uh, South America somewhere. And uh, that had just happened. So my mom's thinking, I'm joining this cult. And uh, she says, well, what do you know about YWAM? And it's like, well, my friend Todd said it's really awesome. And that was all I knew. And uh, they were not happy campers and... Uh, I ended up on a bus from Minneapolis to Los Angeles, and I remember calling to register for the school, and the first person I talked to was Linda Lee, I guess, back then. She wasn't married yet, and my small group leader was Peter Warren. He had long, flowing, beautiful black hair. I don't know. Do you have that in a box somewhere in your closet, Peter? I don't know if you've saved that, but uh, he, was, he was a pretty good-looking guy uh, back then. Uh, not sure what happened now, but... <clears throat> That's Linda's problem. Um, and so I, I'm just, we, like I say, that's my love language is get to tease Peter Warren. So my wife and I were married in uh, 1981. That was an important yes that she said to me. And we said to the Lord together in covenantal marriage. And we started running training programs in Los Angeles with YWAM. And uh, in 1984, our founder, Lauren Cunningham, wrote a book, Is That Really You, God? And I read the book, and in the book, it tells the story of Lauren mobilizing 180 youth to go to the Bahamas on a short-term mission trip. And I looked around YWAM Los Angeles, and we had no high school kids, no young people. And I said to my leaders, I think I'm supposed to mobilize 
high school kids and take them on mission trips. And everybody said, that's great. So I stopped leading schools and I took this group down to Rincon de Romas, a little town north of Mexico City. And we drove too far and it was longer than we thought. And we got to the facility we're gonna stay at. It was a facility designed for like 50 people and there was like 100 of us there. And in the front yard was this beautiful green grass. Uh, It was from the septic tank that was overflowing. And uh, so everybody got sick. So we're here on this outreach. We're trying to preach the gospel and do all this ministry. And everybody was sick. Now you have regular diarrhea. And then you have what I call NED, nuclear explosive (laughs) diarrhea. I remember walking into the bathroom and this poor soul was in there. And it sounded like the space shuttle Columbia taking off. And I said, Paul, are you still there? I was worried he had actually evaporated into the toilet. Um, So it was just horrible. So we got on the bus and we're gonna kinda go through Mazatlan on the way home and sleep on the beach and then kinda rest up and kinda end up back in Los Angeles. And we got to Mazatlan, there was a monsoon rainstorm, there was a foot and a half of water everywhere. Uh, We had no credit cards, no money, Uh, some uh, merciful, little dumpy motel guy gave us rooms, so we all crashed and got a doctor and all got healed up and we started driving back to uh, Los Angeles and we got really close to the US border. And I'm thinking through the last eight or 10 days with the 60 people and I'm thinking, no one learned anything. Sometimes you go through a hard time, you learn something, but, but no one learned anything. Uh, no one got saved, nothing good happened. It was an absolute failure. I think if you Google YWAM's greatest failures, this trip will show up in in the internet somewhere. And uh, I get close to the border, and again, I have this encounter with the living God, and God whispers in my spirit, will you believe me for a tenfold increase in the future? So I'm thinking, wow, 600 people with diarrhea, I don't know. (laughs) Actually, what I felt was, if God was asking me to believe him, to go from 60 to 600, he was also gonna show me how to do it the right way. And it's a weird thing, but hope filled my heart in that moment. So I said yes to the Lord. Yeah, Lord, if you wanna show me how to do this a better way, my yes is all in. A couple months later, I was in Brazil on an outreach and I was just having a little jet lag and walking through a soccer field and I felt like the Lord spoke to me. Will you believe me for a thousand high school kids every summer to go on a short-term mission trip? So I said, yes, Lord, I believe. If you're speaking it to me, I'm gonna believe you for a 1,000. Well, uh, over the next year and a half, two years, uh, we struggled to really get the program going. I was still hanging on in faith. I had my yes to Jesus, but I hadn't seen the fruit of it. And my brother-in-law called me, and he said, look, I got 40 kids in my high school youth group. Your trips are crazy long and they're too expensive. Can you do something just for me and my youth group? And can we go to Tijuana, Mexico? So I'm in LA. That's about three hours north of uh, Tijuana. And I said, sure, let's do it. So he brings down 40 kids from Oregon and we do a little training in LA and then we go to Tijuana. And it was incredible. Because what happened, think of a fire with one log on it. Now you had 40 high school kids that we took them out and we did evangelism, we did mercy ministries and we shared the gospel, we encouraged the churches, we just had this marvelous week and there was 40 people that were on fire for the Lord that all went back to Oregon. And then the word kind of got out, uh, oh, and people started calling me, can I bring my youth group? Can Can I bring my youth group? And we just exploded. And within a few years, we had over 1,200 high school kids that were coming every summer. And then other parts of YWAM started asking me, can we do this too? And we actually created a a name for it called Mission Adventures. And I think uh, Joy and Reagan uh, were a part of that for uh, a short season. And uh, so I'm happy to report to you since that uh, day back in the 80s, more than 150,000 high school kids have gone on a short-term mission. Yeah, go God, go God. That was a pretty small yes, uh, but it's to a big God who had some agendas. He was looking for some volunteers. Uh, as we were going back and forth to Tijuana, uh, I began to meet some of the spiritual leaders of Tijuana. I met this guy named Sergio Gomez. 
Sergio was a drug addict, slept in his car, was alienated from his family, got radically saved, became a pastor, and he also built homes for the poor. And I got to know Sergio, and he would take me around and introduce me to people, and introduce me to the city of Tijuana, which is like two million people, and then you got San Diego right across the border, and then LA just up the road. So I was hanging out with Sergio and his old, old orange GMC pickup truck, and we're bouncing around the backside of Tijuana, and we drove by this little family with a, a four old garage doors and a blue tarp, and he says to me, there's a smart family. And I'm like, what's so smart about that family? He goes, they own their land, and one day there'll be a beautiful house there. Those are the people I help, the ones that show initiative. And uh, I thought, wow, that's really cool. Well, a couple months after that experience, I was the junior leader in YWAM Los Angeles, and my director, Dave, uh, had his quiet time. And he comes up to all of us that were leaders, and he said, okay, we're gonna have an offering for Jesus. And I go, well, that's great, Dave. What's it for? He goes, no, no, you don't understand. Jesus spoke to me in my devotions. We need an offering. And I go, I understand, Dave. All offerings are for Jesus. Like, but what's it for? He goes, you don't understand. Jesus wants an offering. We're gonna take an offering and then later he'll tell us what to do with it. I got one more question, Dave. Why don't we pray first and know what the offering is because it'll be a lot bigger if people know what they're giving. He goes, you don't understand. We're to give money and put it into the hands of Jesus and trust that he will tell us what to do with it. Jesus needs an offering. I go, okay, so we had this two-week buildup. We raised thousands of dollars, and now we're in prayer mode, right? Like, what are we supposed to do with this? So I took one of these trips down to Tijuana, and I came back, and I, I grabbed Dave, and I said, Dave, I think I know what the money's for. It's for the poor. We're supposed to build a house for a family in need. And he goes, that's it, that's it. So 18 of us went down to Tijuana, Mexico to do one house, right? And my wife lets me bring my three and a half year old daughter. I have no idea why she let me do that. I don't really know what she did the whole weekend, but I built a house. But apparently she ends up playing for two days with a family living in an old abandoned bus. And that woman had two daughters and she, she watched out for my Andrea. She took care of her while I was working, and she played with the two daughters. And at the end of the build, it was one of the funnest things I've ever done. I thought to myself, you know, I've been in missions a long time. Building this house this is one of the funnest things I've ever done. And my little three-year-old Andrea pulls on my sleeve, and she goes, Daddy, are you going to build a house for the bus people too? And I was like, ah. Oh. This is not a question from a three and a half year old. This is a question from God. So you gotta remember, I'm using Sergio's process, his tools. He kind of cut me a deal. I got nothing. I got no Jesus offering money. I got nothing. But I had a yes in my spirit. So I said, yeah, Lord, if you'll help me, I'll get another house done. So I drive home and I make one phone call to this Christian high school up in Washington State. And I go, you guys are coming in eight weeks. Uh, I got a question for you. Would you guys pray about helping me build a house for the bus people? Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. I think we can raise the money. I go, oh, great. Uh, by the way, can, can you find some men in the church that are builders? Because I don't have any builders. Uh, well, yeah, probably we can find some guys that know how to build. I go, okay, great. Uh, also, can you bring all your own tools? Because I got nothing, right? I, got, I got no process. So they go, yes, yes, yes. So, so we go and we build the second house. The first year we did four. I think uh, the next year we did 12. And uh, I'm, as Peter mentioned, I'm pleased to report we've done almost 9,000 homes for the poor. Yeah, go God. And it was all from a, a very small yes to an amazing, wonderful, incredible, big God. And I don't think the experience that I'm telling you today is unique to me. As we look at the Bible, and we'll talk about a couple characters in the Bible after I show you a quick video, uh, but I think God is wanting his people to lean in and not lean out, to be able to say yes to the things that are on his heart, 
uh, so that his kingdom and his fruitfulness will be more present in our society. So I want to show you a four-minute video. Uh, this uh, girl, Tanya, you'll see in the video, when her family got a home of hope, her grandmother, so she had mom and dad, a couple of kids, and they were staying with their grandmother. But their grandmother was abject poverty as well. She had a little tiny house with a dirt floor, no room for a family of five. And so the family comes home one day and all of their stuff is in the street. Grandma had kicked them out and she said, I can't take it anymore. I'm poor too. You guys have some land. You go camp there. I can't, I can't help you anymore. So they had land, but they didn't have enough money to build a house. So Tanya is 12 years old. And this isn't in the video, but we'll get to the video in a second. Tanya is 12 years old. And when you're 12, 13 years old in Mexico, the average Mexican uh, has about a sixth grade education. And that's because when you get 12, 13, you kind of begin to be adult size and you can kind of work and do stuff. And so Tanya is about ready to drop out of school to clean houses with her mom because her mom was a house cleaner. And after she got her home of hope, which you'll see a little bit about that story in a second, uh, six months later, she graduated first in her class. And uh, I just always wonder what would Tanya be without that Homes of Hope experience in that moment in her life. But let's watch the video and find out a little bit more about Tanya's story. When did you start? I remember the first night when we arrived. We did not have anything. It was cold and wet, and it was very windy. And everything got wet, including us. All we could do was hug each other. I remember I was so sad because I felt so alone. I don't remember how long passed by, but finally, some people from the church came by and gave us some boards for walls and a tarp roof, but it did not even have a door. We were sleeping in that room when someday some animal bit my dad. His whole hand got swollen and he couldn't work, so we had nothing to eat. I was going to school then, and I told my mom that I wanted to drop out so I could sell gum to help our family. I prayed every night for God to help us. When I went to White Wim to ask them for help, I explained to them the situation that we were living in. And I remember when the White Wim team said they would build our house. After they left, we went outside and jumping and screaming for joy, saying, they are going to build us a house. After we got our house from Homes of Hope, I became the first one in my family to graduate from high school. My mother was so proud of me. She would brag to people about me getting my diploma. There was one lady at church that told her that she shouldn't encourage me because I would just end up cleaning houses like her someday. She said we were all born poor, so we shouldn't dream big. I'm not mad that the lady said that, though. It made me want to prove her wrong, and I did. Now I'm studying nursing at university. Since I was young, my dream was to become a nurse. YWAM has been so great for me, not just because they built us a house, but because there are people that really helped me and motivated me to do more. YWAM gave me the motivation to be more than anyone around me thought I could be. Now I want to become a nurse or a doctor so I can help other people like they helped me. I'm crying tears of joy right now because I'm thinking of what my life would have been without Y1. I want to tell the next generation to dream big and go after it. Yeah. 
Well, I'm, I'm blessed to say Tanya is now a nurse, and her story is remarkable. Uh, we had another uh, story where a young boy, uh, uh, seven years old, used to hate the rain because everything in his house would get wet. Uh, the blue tarp would fill up with water for the roof, and it would break in the middle of the night. All their stuff would get wet. And so a team came to build his family a house, and his thought was, I wonder how many of their tools I could steal. Uh, and so he was plotting how to steal all the tools, but over the next couple of days, uh, he got really engaged with the team, and it was a transformational event. And this young man, Alex, uh, now, many years later, became a professional photographer. He just came back from Saudi Arabia, uh, as a, uh, taking photos over there. I was very wealthy now, very prosperous, and we have him come and tell the story of how much the home impacted his life. So I want to share with you a little pattern out of John chapter 6, and uh, this is the story of the feeding of the 5,000, but there's a lot of great principles in this story, and so the first principle is impossible task. So Jesus turns to the disciples and says, you give them something to eat. So imagine if you're one of the 12 disciples, you're hanging out with Jesus, and there's 5,000 hungry people, and Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And there's a little verse tucked in there, John 6, 6, often unnoticed. Jesus said this to test them because he already had in mind what he wanted to do. Isn't that great? You know, God already has a plan. He's just looking for his people to become available so we can give our small yes to our big God, right? That's, that's really what Jesus wants. So what I love about this story is one of the disciples corrals a, a small boy who has some bread and fish. And another disciple, uh, I call the calculator guy, decides that uh, we gotta count this up. So there's calculator guy in every church, right? Eight months wages wouldn't be enough for everybody to have a bite. In other words, this is impossible. Jesus, you are crazy to ask us to feed the people. But Jesus said this to test them because he already had in mind what he wanted to do. So here comes the power of the story. I call it the improbable volunteer. I think I was that improbable volunteer. When I was in high school, I was an unassuming C student. I was about six feet too tall with dark, dark brown hair. Not sure where my color went. I don't know where your hair went, Peter. But uh, mine used to be dark, dark brown. And, uh, but I was... I was available. I kind of feel like my life was old bread and stinky fish. I don't really have that much to offer God, but I was willing. So this boy comes up and he offers what he has to Jesus. And maybe you feel like that. Maybe you feel like you don't really have that much to offer God. But here's the cool part. Jesus took the offering and he lifted it up to heaven and he gave thanks. And this is what I call an impartation of blessing and power. And whenever Jesus takes what we give him, he blesses it. It leads to an impact into the multitudes. So the disciples start bringing the food out to groups of 50 and 100. How many administrators are here in the church, right? So there's organization in the Bible. They did get organized. But I wonder at what point did the disciples start to realize we're not running out of food. Everything the people need is coming from Jesus, from one group to another. Their food is not running out. We're in the middle of a miracle. So it goes like this, impossible task, improbable volunteer, an impartation of blessing that leads to an impact into the multitudes. We see that in the story of Hannah. Hannah is a very awesome Bible character. She was the first 24-7 prayer lady. She's praying so hard that uh, Eli, the, the high priest, kicked her out of the temple because she thought she was drunk. And she said, no, my Lord, I'm, I'm praying for, for a child. She was, she was barren. And in, in the culture back then, if you didn't have children, it was kind of like you weren't really blessed by God. And so she was wrestling with God. Lord, give me a child. Lord, give me a child. And the Bible says year after year, Hannah went into the temple to pray. No answer, no answer, until... It says this, Hannah said, okay, God, if you give me a son, I'll turn him over to you. See, Hannah wanted something for herself, but God wanted a prophetic voice for the nation of Israel. And Samuel, arguably, is one of the best 
prophets in the Old Testament. So it's a little bit like, I think it's uh, Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God, then everything else will be added unto you. God is looking for our small yeses. And when Hannah said yes to what God wanted, she got pregnant. We have Samuel. And if you keep reading, she has four other children that are given to her in that moment. So let's look at uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his difficult, unpleasant, and hard will. Is that what your Bible says, that God's will is not fun, difficult, unpleasant, right? Is that that what your Bible says? No, it says God's will is good, acceptable, and perfect. If you go back to verse one, think about this. This is true worship. If you ever thought, okay, God, what do you really want with me? Everything you got. He wants your future. He wants your money. I don't want your money. God does, right? Like, so I'm, this is not a hyper uh, prosperity message. This is a lordship message, message. God wants us to crawl up on the altar and say, God, whatever you want to do with my life, you got my yes. Now, here's the problem. On the other side is, well, what if I say yes to God and I don't like what God tells me I'm supposed to do? So if we go all the way back to Genesis, the first humans to sin, we know, are Adam and Eve. And so there was the beautiful uh, forbidden fruit uh, in the middle of the garden, and then you had abundance. All of the other fruit trees were available for Adam and Eve to eat. And the evil one, he likes to trick us. So he gets Eve over by the the forbidden fruit, and the devil says, uh, did God really say? And that's one of the first temptations that'll come to us. Did God really say for you to do that? Are Are you sure? And Eve does really well. She says, yes, God did say, don't eat from this tree, but we can eat from all the other trees. Ah, the devil's bummed out. He's trying to think, oh man, how do I get Eve? How do I get Eve? Oh, I know. I'll make her doubt God's intentions. So he says this to Eve. See that fruit? It's beautiful. It's, you're gonna know good and evil. And what the devil was really saying to Eve is, do not trust God. He does not have your highest in mind. God only thinks about himself. God just wants to use you up like a paper towel that you wipe up some water or a spill with and then you're thrown into the trash can. You cannot trust God. He's just gonna abuse you. He's just gonna suck all the life out of you. But if you, eat, if you choose for yourself, you're gonna be better off. So the very first sin in the Bible, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is unbelief over the character of God. Eve doubted that God's uh, intentions for her were, were uh, appropriate or perfect. And uh, so we go back to uh, Romans 12, and we see that God's will is good, acceptable, and perfect. Uh, I often think of like a Wednesday night or a Thursday night, if you have like a small group time or a testimony night, and you have a bunch of people get an opportunity to ask for a prayer, inevitably there'll be somebody who'll do this. Brothers, sisters, pray for me. It's so hard to serve God. And everybody goes, oh, yeah, it's hard to serve God. Oh, let's pray. Let's pray for this, brother. It's so hard. And we'll all start praying. I have an idea for you. Let's try and serve the devil for a while and see how fun that is, right? Like, it's not hard to serve God. It's hard to come to the trust that God's will for you is good, acceptable, and perfect. Or two believers talking in the lobby, and one says, uh, I sure hope God doesn't send me to the Amazon. I might have to eat tree bark and sleep in a hammock for the rest of my life. And another believer will say, don't say that. Because if you say you don't want to go to the Amazon, that's where God will send you. As if God is kind of this demented uh, spiritual power that whatever we think we like, he does the opposite, right? That's not who God is. God's will for us is good, acceptable, and perfect. I've got a little younger, a bunch of grandkids, six of them, and when Evelyn was young, that's one of my grandkids, 
Uh, I love two-year-olds, and I love taking two-year-olds out for ice cream. What's cool about two-year-olds is they walk like penguins, you know, like they're two, and you got their hand, right, and you take them in, and you're going to get them an ice cream cone, right? So you know what happens when that two-year-old gets that first big lick on the ice cream cone, right? You know what's going to happen, right? They're uh, a, ice cream falls on the ground, the ants are now in it, there's dirt everywhere. What does the two-year-old do? My ice cream, that's my ice cream, I want my ice cream. So they start trying to put it all back together. What the two-year-old doesn't realize is I am Papa in my household, that's my, my name. We got Gigi, my wife, and Papa. And what my little granddaughter doesn't understand is I have three credit cards and cash, and we have the power and ability to go back into the ice cream store, this time to get a cup, and what we're going to do this time is we're going to put some uh, vanilla, chocolate, uh, we're going to put some bananas in there, hot fudge, maybe some nuts and a bunch of whipped cream, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be awesome. So I start to take Evelyn and pull her into the ice cream store. Guess what she does? No, no, I want my ice cream, I want my ice cream. Like, you don't get it. I have special powers. I have three credit cards. I have cash. The ice cream store is right here. We're gonna, this is gonna be even better than you could think of. No, no, someone's in the parking lot dialing 911. Child abuse happening here in the ice cream store, right? What's amazing, though, is we're an awful lot more like a two-year-old than we probably want to admit. God starts speaking, hey, I want you to do some new things. I want you, no, no, I love my pathetic life. Don't make me change. I just love being pathetic. And I think God is waiting for his people to do some small yeses. It might be to pick up the phone and pray for your neighbor who has cancer or maybe take them to an appointment, bring some cookies over to them, whatever it is. It doesn't have to turn into uh, 9,000 homes and 30 countries, right? It could be something small. We don't know. But what we do know is when we say yes to the little voice of the Lord, in even a small step of obedience that Jesus does an impartation of blessing will have an impact onto the multitudes. And that's what God is looking for. Uh, when I was growing up in Minnesota, they used to have the old Milwaukee beer commercials, right? Bunch of old guys sitting around the lake the sun is setting, they got some fish that they caught, and they got their old Milwaukee beer, and they all turn to the camera in this perfect sunset moment, and they look into the camera and they say, it just doesn't get any better than this, old Milwaukee beer, right? And then you kind of want to go out and buy the beer, right? So I'd love to do a Will of God commercial, you know, people sacrificing, obeying God, listening, their small yeses, God blesses it, and we all turn to the camera, the will of God, it just doesn't get any better than this, right? Like, let's look at who we're serving. Yeah, you have this, this holy call at the beginning of Romans 1. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice. Ooh, that's lordship. Those are, that's a tough message. But look at the other side, too. God's will for you is good, acceptable, and perfect. And I'm looking for, I'm 65, I'm a little bit like uh, Caleb, I think it was, uh, said I'm 85, but give me this mountain, I'm not quite 85, but uh, I'm gonna keep saying yes to Jesus, because don't tell anybody, you know, being a YWAM is a challenge. Uh, my dad was a carpet layer for 45 years, got on his hands and knees and pulled up old carpet, put down new carpet, to me that's hard. When I look at the life given me, a lot of sacrifice, but there's a lot of blessings too. I remember in a moment, we, in 1991, my wife and I moved from Los Angeles and started YWAM San Diego Baja. A lot of you have been to our Tijuana campus, which is a, just a beautiful facility. And in the early years, uh, things didn't go so well. We were pioneering. I started with $1,000 and a pat on the back and some prayer. And we paid the first month's rent on this little rental facility, and I was totally broke 48 hours into starting YWAM San Diego Baja. So those first few years were, were challenging. And uh, one day my accountant came to me and said, uh, I got to confess something to you. I've been doing cocaine. I said, well, that's not good. And then he kind of had, had to leave and get rehab, and we're $50,000 in debt, and the, all the other staff started leaving. It was a sinking ship. 
And I lost all my confidence. And I remember sitting in a little tiny basement of a rental house we had. And I looked at my wife and I said, what do you want to do? I said, I'm not a very good leader. Let's do something you want to do. And my wife is very godly, starts crying. And she says, I just want to be in the will of God. Because she knew the will of God is good, acceptable, and perfect. And I started crying and go, I just want to be in the will of God too. But I didn't know what it was. And we prayed. And it wasn't an audible voice, but the Spirit of God came on both of us. I still remember it like it happened yesterday, a holy moment. And we both felt the Spirit of God say, do not quit. I have called you to this place. Persevere. Things will get better. And so we rolled up our sleeves. Six months later, we got out of debt. We kept rolling with Homes of Hope. And uh, a couple months later, uh, we were just living in rental places. We never thought we'd ever even own a home. And I get this anonymous check in the mail from this donor advised fund for enough money to buy a house in San Diego. Back then it was $150,000. Now it's be a lot more. Uh, So we took that gift and bought our home that we still have. And I look back and I see the goodness of God uh, when we have these little small yeses to our big, big God. And then John 15, 16, I have called you, I have chosen you to bear fruit, fruit that remains. My friends, I I, I miss it too. I'm not up here. I've I've got a lot of good yeses and I've got some times I look back and I go, man, I missed it there. But I just want to encourage you, if God starts speaking, you give them something to eat, and you're going, how am I going to feed 5,000 people? Look at John 6.6. 6. Jesus said this to test them, because he already had in mind what he wanted to do. Uh, a lot of times when we think about what God wants, we ask our wallets what to do. So if you ask your wallet what to do related to the things of God, this is what your wallet always says. No, don't do it. You, you don't have money. Yes, it's not going to work out very well. Like, don't do it. No. It always says the same thing. It never says yes. Your wallet always says no. So don't listen to your wallet. Listen to God. Obey what God has for you, and you will have an incredible, fruitful, amazing life, and you'll live in the fullness and the richness of God's goodness. God is looking for some small yeses, just like Abraham It's God's power, his ability that makes it all come to pass. All he wants is availability and our yes and our agreement with what he has for our lives. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you're a good, 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 good God. And our small yeses to your plans and purposes lead to great fruitfulness. And Lord, this morning, I pray for each and every one of my new friends that a fresh spirit of faith and trust would come into their hearts as you begin to speak and lead and guide them into new things, that they would find a joy and a strength in their yeses, and that they would have trust towards the character of God whose will for us is good, acceptable, and perfect. Put a fresh infusion of faith into our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen.